Welcome to Strength in Leos. What is up, everybody? It's Evan back with the Strength in Leos podcast, and I'm here to bring you the last episode of season three of the podcast. Before we get started, I wanted to thank everyone for the success of this season in so many ways. We've expanded our reach when it comes to more listeners, listeners from different countries, more reach from others within the reptile hobby. We had an awesome multi-part series with Matt Baronic from Sasobek, the Uncovering Sasobek series, which was a huge success due to you guys and so much more. So thank you again for everything. Also, don't forget to wait until the end of this episode to hear who won the latest Rainbow Mealworm gift certificate giveaway. But that's it. Let's get into the episode. And before we go on, I want to say thank you to our sponsors. The Blessed Gecko over the last five years has acquired an incredible variety of geckos from some of the top genetics available. In the past, they have maintained all animals within their own collection as holdbacks as they have taken time to observe genetic pairings, dispositions, sizes, coloration, patterning, and etc. Go check them out on Facebook and Instagram and of course go check out what they have available for sale. Impeccable Gecko is a small to mid-sized family operated hobbyist breeder operation. They specialize in leopard geckos with high quality genetics. At Impeccable Gecko, integrity and animal welfare is above all else. Miles Schwartz works with some awesome morphs and lines that are not only high quality, but also fairly rare in the hobby. Go check out their social media and awesome YouTube channel. John Scarborough of Gecko Boar Reptiles has kept and bred more than 80 species of reptiles and his focus has turned to specializing within the genus Eublepharis. He has worked hard to pioneer some of the most cutting edge leopard geckos while maintaining genetic purity and honesty. Go check out their website for their most up to date availability and don't forget to follow all of their social media. Suburban Geckos is operated by Chris Charlton. Chris's passion and enjoyment for herpticulture and more specifically leopard geckos drove the desire to take his hobby to the next level. The Bourbon Geckos treats every animal with the utmost care and respect and cut no corners when it comes to the health and integrity of their geckos. Suburban so Geckos is a strong supporter of the Strength and Leos podcast, so follow them on social media and check out what they have available for sale. Grove Geckos is a family-owned and oriented medium-scale leopard gecko business. Lance Musgrove is a hobbyist breeder with the goal of producing healthy, visually stunning, and refined genetics for their geckos. They can be found online at grovegeckos.com or on social media like Facebook and Instagram. Give them a follow and reach out to Lance at any time. Spotty Tail Geckos is a small hobbyist breeder that focuses on quality genetics and maintaining excellent husbandry. Andy got started in the hobby when his daughter wanted a pet leopard gecko. He immediately fell in love with the animals and the hobby. Andy started breeding his first leopard geckos in 2015. To this day, he keeps a very small collection sourced from top tier breeders. What's up, everybody? It's Evan back with the Strength and Leo's podcast, and we're back with a very anticipated guest that hasn't been on for a while, so we're glad to have him back. Uh, we have John from Gecko Bar Reptiles. John, welcome back to the podcast. Hey, right, thanks for having me. <laughs> Sorry, my dogs are a little <laughs> crazy right now. Stop her. Dogs or not, we're glad to have you yeah, back on, they, man. They're paying <laughs> attention right now, so <laughs> as always. <laughs> Nice. So, like we said, it's been a while since you've been on the podcast. A lot of changes in your facility, um, also gecko-wise. A lot of cool stuff's been happening on your end. Um, so, I think when we left off, it was like kind of COVID happening. We had that big roundtable. So, from um, you know that point, like, what do you think have been like some of the biggest changes that you know we could talk about today, and then some you know other stuff that um, has been going on gecko-wise, and you know just going through updates and stuff. Well, I think the facility is probably the most interesting thing that's happened since then. I've been so busy with that and um, just been working on that build for uh, basically two years straight almost. Um, I started, really started getting in the planning process, like actually getting stuff um, going was the beginning of 2020. And then everything happened with COVID and um, kind of going through that whole summer trying to I did a lot of work myself, but I was also trying to hire some people out to help me with that and um, just going through that whole whole process of learning some new things and trying to, you know, figure out how exactly I wanted my facility to run and um, exactly what I wanted in my um, facility to make it perfect. Because it's one of those things like if you kind of don't think of something when you're building it, you kind of can't go back on a lot of that stuff. So. Um, right. Yeah, that's been a major update in my life, and it's basically 
kept me so busy the last couple of years and that's why I put you off for so long. <laughs> but I'm back. <laughs> Finally yeah, back. Feeling, feeling yeah. a little relieved so, now at this point, but it's taking a while. That's awesome. Yeah, so like you've been in this, you know, breeding geckos for, you know, ten plus years now. So why why now the time to, you know, build a new facility and kind of get the geckos in their own space and um kind of like, you know, expand and take that next step as a breeder? Um, well, I've always had the geckos kind of in their own space, but it was always in the house, like most of us, um, either in a basement, extra right. rooms, or recently in a garage. Um, but this is, I'm finally at a place where I think I'm going to stay for the long run. And um, just now it's more of a permanent situation. Every time before it was like, I didn't know how long I was going to be there for. So I'm finally at a place where I think I'm going to stay. And um, it was the right time. It's a, you know, not only that, it's building your business up to to be able to afford it for one. Um, as well, it's expensive to, <laughs> to build everything up from the ground up. So, um, right. you know, racks are one thing. You got to purchase all your racks and your thermostats and all your equipment. But, you know, building a, an actual building from the ground up is quite a bit more than that. So, um, right. yeah, it's just expenses and just finally being at the right spot now, um, place where I can call home. So. Um, yeah, but yeah. So like based on your like facility, like why did you decide to, you know, obviously you, you mentioned you built it kind of from the ground up. So that takes a lot of like blueprinting and, you know, kind of getting all those features that you want to have noticed before, before you start building and such. So why did you want to build a facility rather than just get like a commercial space or a warehouse and then kind of just go from that? It'll be a lot easier on your standpoint where you don't have to think about building, but, um, you know, there's some pros and cons there. Well, uh, like a commercial space, you got to drive into all the time. I don't necessarily trust my geckos at a commercial space. You know, you're not always there to, you know, if something goes wrong with the temperatures or, you know, whatever reason, you got to, with this type of business, I always kind of have to, I just feel like I have to be there um, just, to, just to monitor everything. Um, also for working with the animals, there's a lot of little jobs here and there, whether I'm just going out to, pull some mealworms out of the fridge and gut load them. And, you know, that's a, you know, 10 minute, 15 minute job. Whereas, you know, I don't want to have to drive into a facility to do that every time. Um, right. It's always just convenience of being at home with them as well. But um, yeah, just, it's just, uh, it's always the way I was going to have it, you know, even having it not in your basements, you know, having to walk over to another building is far enough for me. And I hate driving. So yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, I don't want to commute to work anymore. So, yeah. yeah, no, that definitely makes sense. And even I think just having that space on your, you know, property, that's nice to have that, you know, that closeness where if, again, like you said, something happened or even like just doing small tasks, you want to go back home for something right quick or if something happened and you have that, you know, feasibility to do that, which is really cool. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of my dream spot for this. And it's always, you know, working in, basements and garages and extra rooms has always been just less than ideal and trying to deal with ventilation and having that in the house with your family is a, a problem especially when you start getting up there on numbers of geckos and, and what right. do you do with the feeders you know and trying to solve that problem so um you know being able to design it from the ground up and just be able to have it the way i want because even a commercial space you know probably won't be the way i wanted it to be yeah so into planning when you first decided um you wanted to like get going on this what were kind of the final the the first steps that you took to get started on planning and where do you even start if you're you know someone who's um you know built up their business to a spot where you really want to get into that time where you're able to build something up and get something started for yourself um well i've been thinking about this for a really long time <laughs> i mean and a lot of it comes by trial and error over the years um you know being in a i was in a thousand square foot basement at my last place and just kind of seeing what worked and that's really when i started growing on the numbers and um with the geckos and so um you figure out what what you want over time even you know the sizes of your racks um, the type of thermostats you want to use what type of incubators you want to use and i'm still learning to this day but um you kind of learn over time what you want and um you can kind of solve some of those problems that you had at the old like your you know in your basement or your garage and you can kind of solve some of those problems for instance like 
I I wanted floor heat in my my new facility because my racks have always had the problem of being too cold at the bottom, especially if you have them on concrete, like if you have them in a basement or a garage. So um, I always wanted to put hydronic floor heating in, um, and that was you know one of the things I knew I've wanted for a long time. Um, and then just better ventilation systems, more efficient. Um, you know, redundancies on, you know, making sure the temperatures are correct. Um, so I have a lot of the systems in. There's a few things I would have gone back and changed at this point, but for the most part, I got everything about where I wanted it. Nice. Cool. So and in addition to all of that stuff, what are some features that you think are, you know, really important that people should think about or just things that you really wanted, um, in terms of like size and I don't know, just in terms of like how you wanted everything to be spaced in your new facility? Um, well, figuring out the spacing was um, mostly dependent on how big I wanted to be as a breeder and how many racks I wanted to keep and how open I wanted to keep that concept in there. So um, being in smaller spaces and kind of anything from, you know, 700 square feet to 1,000 square feet, typically, I knew I wanted something at least 1,000 square feet um, and something a little more open um where i'm not like you know having to run racks down aisles and kind of just i don't want that close off space when i'm working really so um i wanted to keep it very open so i only have racks on the outside walls i don't have anything in the middle so i got a lot of space in the middle um in my new sh shop i know i wanted to keep the mealworms and the feeders completely separated from everything they are a big source of uh, dust and allergens and you know stuff you don't want to be breathing all the time and also uh, they contribute to a lot of smell so I built a room inside the the facility also that kind of closes them off and I have ventilation that goes directly outside so there's always a negative pressure in that room that um, constantly not letting that mealworm dust or the roach dust out of there so it's always pulling air out of there um ventilation is a huge thing when you get to, to a bigger level um you don't want to be breathing this stuff all the time you want to keep the air fresh not only for you but for your animals um you know if you have a couple hundred geckos in a room it's usually not too bad you can probably put in a little window fan or something like that but when you start you know increasing the numbers um and especially um, with the baby season or hatchling season you know you start that smell can start uh, growing quite a bit so um, one thing that I knew I wanted for a while and I kind of solidified with this shop was uh, HRV ventilation system um, which basically exchanges the air from the outside to the end and a lot of homes are using it now so the idea is to hold on one second my dog. <laughs> dogs are crazy so HRV ventilation. So it basically it's called heat recovery, heat recovery ventilation. And it, um, it basically exchanges the outside air with the inside air. Um, and so you're always bringing fresh air in and you're, you're pulling the air out. So it's keeping a kind of a balanced pressure in your room. You can, you can adjust it to put a negative or positive pressure as well, depending on what you want. Um, but, uh, this is also the, the whole point of that besides just having a vent, um, that's, or a fan just sucking air out and just having vents um, pulling air in is this one actually exchanges the heat as it goes in and out. So it goes through kind of like a, um, a honeycomb type system where the, the air actually never touches itself, but it's, it's exchanging the heat because it goes through the system that's um, basically transferring the heat from one, um, the air coming in to the air going out. And then it works in reverse in the summer. So when it's, you know, cold inside and hot outside it'll actually trap a lot of that cold air for you and so you're not losing you know you can ventilate a lot a lot more without losing all your heat in your um in your workspace um they're using it on a lot of new home builds where you try to tighten your home up a lot and then you use an hrv system to usually suck air out of like the bathrooms and the kitchen areas and then bring them into living spaces it's the same concept in a shop um a lot of the ideas I got too was like looking at woodworking um, uh, type situations because they do they deal with a lot of dust, and so um, like using some I have some of the woodworking um, filtration systems as well in there, um, but um, using HRV ventilation system has made a big difference in there and helping keeping that fresh air going. And nice. I installed the whole thing. I put in um, you know spiral duct 
piping so that's like the real nice duct piping because it's exposed and um it's it's pretty nice to have it set up the way it is it's always bringing in that fresh air and i got it on full blast all the time and it really you know i hardly have even an electric bill at all anymore <laughs> it's crazy how much nice. better it's been yeah that's crazy yeah and especially like we all know what it's like dealing with feeders and especially mealworms how you get all that stuck that shed and that frass rolling around the room so yeah it's nice you don't have to deal with that it's bad for your health in the long run too and i'm thinking about that because i'm you know i've already been doing this quite a while with the mealworms and stuff too so i don't want to i haven't had any allergies that i really know of um but um i don't want to you know induce anything that's not necessary (laughs) right and also you've been taking those measures beforehand to make sure you don't you know get those allergies before i know a lot of people just we've seen a lot of people in this hobby who just kind of got out of it because of that so um no it's good to to hear you're taking those precautions also yeah yeah i would say if you're ever planning your facility you know obviously you're thinking about heating and cooling but also think about ventilation big time with animals anytime you're dealing with animals so you know it's it's, you got to keep these enclosed in a building it's not like you know cows in a dairy farm or something but yeah you you where you can have massive ventilation systems and they're fine in colder weather you got to keep the you know geckos a little warmer and kind of enclosed so it makes it a little bit more of a challenge without you know you keeping your fresh air environment in there for your geckos exactly yeah so along with that stuff i know kind of heating and cooling is a big a big thing especially since we're dealing with you know heating and especially in racks and everything and just ambient temperature so what did you kind of do to make sure you had all of that um, set up and what kind of heating and cooling did you decide to use? I know you mentioned the heating floors, which is super awesome, um, but just for ambient heat temperature and everything, um, how'd you go about doing that kind of stuff? Um, most important thing probably is just insulation, first of all, um, just trying to get the best insulation you can uh, with as little air gaps as possible. Um, that way, oh, you know, your racks actually generate a lot of heat on their own, so you can, you know, rather than heat twice where you're, you know, you're, you're losing a lot of heat through your bad insulation. Um, your racks will actually insulate or, or heat up a room quite a, quite a bit without, you know, so you, you're not losing all that if your insulation's good. So that's number one, um, the floor heating. So I try to use that first just to keep the floor warm rather than just ice cold, especially in the winter. Um, that way those lower levels are not so cold on the racks. Um, so I have uh, hydronic floor heating where I have basically, if people aren't familiar with that, it's basically you're using a boiler, kind of like a hot water boiler for your home. Um, you can do an open system, which is connected to your tap line or your water lines, or you can do a closed system like I did where you use um, at least like a 50% glycol mix. And it basically is circulating this water um, through your floors, it has big loops that are usually about 300 feet long. Um, you, you kind of run them across your floor before the concrete's poured. So these uh, tubes or pecs, their O2 barrier um, pecs, is put in the floor and this water goes through the boiler system. Um, it's a little more complicated than this, but I'm simplifying it. But it goes through the boiler system and heats it up and it goes back through your floor and um, by the time it gets back it's cooled down a little bit and the process repeats and so you have the system where it's heating your floor um, in the concrete with basically these glycol water mix um, in these tubes so and that's on a thermostat as well you can run a thermostat on the the air temperature i run it on the slab temperature so i drill a hole into the concrete slab and then put a probe just like you do um, with your thermostats on your racks when you run it to your heat tape so you just okay. run it to the slab and you, you base it off of that and you can raise or lower the, the slab temperature um, nice. to whatever you want. So I have complete control of the temperature of my floor. Um, and then I have a mini split that I installed as well. Um, basically a mini splits like kind of like, a, you know, your regular condenser air conditioner um, okay. usually used for garages and smaller spaces. But you basically just have to run a condenser line to the outside to the condenser. Um, and yeah, it's pretty, pretty simple. That's very efficient because that's drawing heat from the outside, actually. Even when it's really cold, a, a mini split can still pull air. You know, it works as a heat pump in the winter. So it can pull air or heat from the outside even when it's really cold. And then in the summer, that's what I use to cool. But yeah. Yeah. So Sounds super energy efficient, too. So for people yeah. worrying about like high bills and stuff like that. 
Yeah, I think the one I got was 21 seer, so really good, um, even compared to mini splits from a couple of years ago. You know, that's very wow. high. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it works great. And then I have all these the nice thing too is like the mini splits. I have an app for them on my phone so I can adjust those on the fly anywhere I'm at. So I have oh, nice. actual sensors in my room that um, are hooked up to the Wi-Fi as well. that tell me if the temperatures ever get low or high. And so I got four of those in the room. I got two in the incubators. So in both of my incubators and then I have one in my feeder room and then I also one in the gecko room. And so I have alerts on that too. So if it ever gets too low or high, it alert me and I can always check it and see where it was the whole day or the whole year even. It goes pretty far back. Um, also, it keeps records I, of everything. Yeah, it keeps records okay. of your ups and highs and lows every day and you can adjust your alerts. It's a really nice system. Um, the one I use is Sensor Push. There's a few of them, but um, the one I, this one works pretty good. And you just, you, once you get like this wire, uh, Wi-Fi gateway thing, it, it's basically like a hub for it. And then it, yeah, you can put multiple sensors on one gateway and then it hooks up to your phone and gives you alerts. Okay. So, and then my, no, my awesome. mini split does the same thing. So it also is a backup yeah. as well. So, so they're all connected through your phone and you could all control mm -hmm. that from basically anywhere. Wow. Yeah. I could be sitting right here and I could, you know, see the temperature in my room got a little low or something and I can raise it up a little bit. Um, my, my slab heating through the hydronic floor heating. I don't, um, I don't have anything hooked up to Wi-Fi with that, but that's kind of one of those things where you want to just set it and leave it. Um, you're not making quick adjustments with your, your floor heating because right. any, any type of heating from the floor is going to take a while to radiate up, but yeah, um, that's right. a very simple system with that. Just to just push up and down thermostat. Nice. So with, um, uh, obviously with like all those elements and also like having a bigger, um, kind of space for all your geckos and stuff. I know especially last year um everything that happened in like places like texas and stuff with like crazy winters and uh you know just natural disasters and stuff like that so do you have generators for all that stuff or how do you make sure like everything's safe in that with that stuff basically um i don't yet i do want to either get like a diesel backup generator um okay. i've been looking at those they are pretty pricey um i've been just relying on the same method i've always have is uh just being you know, close at hand and always having the, the Bluetooth monitors or the Wi-Fi monitors on them. Um, and that way I can make quick adjustments if needed. Um, having my facility the way it is, like even if power goes out, it'd be hours and hours before anything starts cooling down much in there. Um, just having the insulation. Another reason to have the insulation that way too. So um, power goes out because we're only on electricity here. If the power goes out, okay. it'll actually shut off my ventilation at the same time. So it actually works to my benefit. So I'm not actually losing some of that heat at the same that time heat. so that whole room will stay you know a good temperature um for a long time uh, we don't get too many power outages here um they pretty much plan ahead for most of that stuff but um maybe in the future either like a generac uh diesel generator like a backup that automatically goes on or you know maybe going solar and having battery backups i mean those are oh, nice. two yeah. two things that i'm looking at right now i'm kind of leaning towards solar just to <laughs> yeah know, fit for some of that you know power consumption so right especially if you're on electricity already yeah exactly my shop's perfectly aligned i mean when i'm a little farther north i'm up in idaho so i don't get tons of sun up here but um definitely in the summer i get quite a bit so um the shop roof is you know i think it's 212 roof i can't remember exactly it's either 112 or two i think it's 212 um, but it's a good pitch for the the sun and everything and it faces um that direction as well so yeah it's, nice. it's definitely something i'm looking at okay and in terms of like security and stuff i know that's also a thing that people are starting to add with their their geckos and stuff like that do you have any like security system set up or anything like that yeah without going too much in detail i'm not, <laughs> not gonna tell everybody right yeah full exactly. security plan but <laughs> Yeah, lots yeah. of cam lots of cameras, different types of systems are probably the most important. Um, you know, being here all the time for the most part, you know, dogs. <laughs> um, <laughs> they have a few few backups besides that, but yeah, I have I mean it's it would be pretty hard. I'm I'm on a you know, a few acres here, so um right. you know, yeah. somebody sneaking up on my property, I'd kinda I have I've sensors around the property as well for different things and um, and they have a lot of different options with that, even, you know, uh, trail cams and stuff like that, that are hooked up to your phone. You just pay like a monthly service through Verizon or whatever company you can set those up as well. 
Um, okay. But, yeah. Nice. Yeah. I have multiple yeah. backups on that stuff. And, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't operate a public, uh, like shop here. I don't bring anybody over here. So that's another right, thing. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Had, no one's trying to find out your password. <laughs> yeah, I had bad experiences from that in the past. I mean, most people are, are good, you know, and I used to let everybody come over and see my geckos, and, and it kind of turned into where people started just showing up randomly. <laughs> <laughs> really? It, yeah, I had up. a couple a couple instances where they just showed up out of nowhere, and I'm like, uh, what are you doing here? But, yeah, it's... Uh, That's crazy. Yeah, I promised my wife I would never do that again, so... Right, yeah. <laughs> we're, we're, Show up while you're yeah. having dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be weird. <laughs> yeah, no one to show up to John's house, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, that's that's great to have you know security in, in place, especially with the time that you've put into your collection. Obviously, money wise and monetarily, um, it's really important to just you know keep all those things in mind and just things that a lot of people don't think about when they're you know starting to build and build especially outside um the house i think it's another thing when you're you know you've obviously had a lot of experience with building inside the house and you know inside rooms and stuff like that but it's completely different when you're building outside of that and especially when you're building something that's not just you know using a shed um and then like finding some way to turn that into like an actual facility but you are really just taking the time and the effort to do that planning and really get that um set up where you're able to have a nice facility the way you want it and then you know something that's really functional for geckos which is completely different yeah it's been a, it's been a long road for sure and you know it, i mean if you're in your home i mean or you know, in the basement or stuff that's a, a good setup as well especially if you can have ventilation that goes out and sort of into your house you know i always tell people that is if you have it, your geckos in a room or in your basement you know try to ventilate to the outside and always have negative pressure you know going out and say you're not breathing that your family isn't breathing all that stuff but right um yeah you know even if you're not smelling it or you don't think you're smelling it like usually people that you know are not around geckos all the time they'll come in and be like what's that smell and you kind of realize <laughs> you know there is something there <laughs> a couple but, thousand geckos in the basement <laughs> yeah yeah, and I've, right. I've tried everything. I've tried everything from, you know, light-duty ozone machines and, like, uh, deionizers and all, you know, carbon filtration. And nothing really works better than just getting the air outside and exchanging it. So, nice. Um, fil yeah. Filters have their place for sure, you know, but there's, uh, you know, most of the fresh air is needed from, you know, ex air exchange. Yeah, and especially the area you live in, it's not, you know, not a ton of people over there and not a bunch of pollution. So it's not even <laughs> polluted yeah. air that's getting in there. <laughs> well, the, the HRV systems plus. have a filter for the air coming in as well, which is nice. So okay, you nice. Know, you know, if you have like wildfire smoke or stuff like that, it actually is better because, you know, traditionally you would just turn on bathroom vents or you just have a leaky house that just has a lot of air gaps. And that's how you're getting your air and your, your air exchange in your house. Um, but, um, with with the hrv system if you close off your house or your shop or whatever and you um exchange it on your pace you actually have a fill you know you can put a merv 13 or whatever in there um even i think i think you even put a hepa coming in but you know um i i you, you can just keep those filters on there so if you have wildfire smoke or anything like that it'll actually help out with that as well nice so. no what else have you seen in terms of just benefits of having a, a space outside i know it's Obviously not feasible for everybody to, you know, have that, but in terms of just having your own facility and your own space to kind of just dedicate to the animals, um, what have you seen as just like a big benefit rather than just having it um, like in your house? Mm, you do feel more professional. <laughs> it's one thing, you know, a lot of this is, you know, you're, you're trying to motivate yourself and get out there and do the work. Um, and that can be tough sometimes. So like being professional, like being in the garage for the last couple of years was absolutely horrible for me like it was demotivating that's just not something i wanted to do every day and so um now that i'm out here and it's you know all nice and new and professional and i actually have i mean i haven't even talked about a lot of stuff i put in there but you know i have like a vacuum set up set up on the wall it's mounted to the wall and it's uh, nice. I got a hose reel on it so i got a 50 foot hose vacuum that i unreal anytime i need to vacuum something up real quick just having those can you know, that convenience of doing that rather than hauling around a shot vacuum every time you're, you know, you got a spill or calcium powder falls or cocoa fiber, whatever, you know, and yeah. just keeping that it, the place clean and having it all just set up really nice. Um, I mean, that's there's a lot of motivation to that having it set up well. 
Um, you know, it's the same thing when you're using like homemade racks. You know, I think we've all built, you know, homemade racks at one point or, you know, homemade stuff and having professional racks that actually work and you're not like losing geckos because of the, you know, the tall is wrong. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I th we've all been there and, um, you know, that's, it's good, good to learn how to build those and see what you want. And, you know, a lot of people don't know the size tub they want to work with or, you know, they just kind of buy whatever the breeder they you know, told them to buy and you learn later that you kind of make mistakes with some of that stuff. And, you know, I've, I've upgraded a lot of my stuff to, to larger tubs and, um, you know, helps out a lot. I think it's better for the animals too. You know, a lot of breeders are keeping them in 15 quarts before, and I've gone away from that now. So, um, I think, I think you just learn uh, what you really want and, you know, learn your animals and, um, everything you need and, Nice. You know, having your own space that's where you built it from the ground up, and it's been a long road to get there for sure. And um, I got a few more gray hairs because of it, but <laughs> um, it's it's been worth it. Now that it's all said and done, it's been worth it. So, yeah, and obviously there's a lot of trial and error with that. Obviously, the stuff you were doing your first season breeding is not the stuff you're doing now, or just equipment you're using. There's a lot of differences. So, is there something that like going forward, if you were to redo this again, is there anything that you think like, oh, well, next time I'll, if, you know, if there's another upgrade, then I'll add this feature in or change this little bit or just small things that you think you tweak in the future or if you'd have to redo it again that you change? Yeah, there's a, there's a few things. I, I probably would have, um, one thing I, I did that made a lot, it's not necessarily bad, but it made a lot more work for myself is I put a, a two head unit, a, um, mini split system so I had one condenser on the outside and I wanted to have two air handlers on the inside that would you know I, I think in my head I thought I would have a backup because of that um, if one went out or and I also that that model was rated at a higher energy efficiency so um, I think I would have with my with my shop I have rib panels on the outside the metal rib panels and then on the inside I actually um, we framed it out with wood you know with your typical 16 on center you know studs and we have there's also um, uh, some I think they're girts for the for the building um, and so when I was well I was putting in this mini split system it comes with set line lengths um, so I was doing like the do-it-yourself unit um, and I had to time that out, like with the, the wall and all the, the, um, it just made a lot more work cause I was having to drill these holes in exact spots where there weren't any studs. And it was also in the center of a rib and trying to measure it from the inside to the outside. And it just created a ton of work for me. And looking back now, I should have just got a, a one, uh, air handler system. I mean, that's kind of minor though. Cause now it's installed. It works great. But, um, yeah. um, other than that, I mean, there's a lot of things I would have probably not purchased that I didn't end up using. I wasted some money on different things. Like I originally wanted windows in my shop and um, later found out that those were highly prone to leaking. And I don't know why. I, I, I just didn't know, like, you know, the problems with that with a metal building. Yeah. Um, I, so I wasted some money there. And there's a, there's a few things like that where, you know, I just probably could have save some money or you know like my water heater i use a hot water heater for my water line and um you know i purchased i think or i got like four or five of them in before i finally got the one that wasn't damaged you know it was crazy wow. i just kept yeah they kept sending me damaged ones and, <laughs> i mean i ended up just going with a different brand because it just could i couldn't get a one that wasn't damaged you know so yeah um, That's but insane. you know hindsight's 2020 on all that stuff so exactly. I, mean, I think i did okay considering <laughs> But. right no it definitely and even just the planning for all that stuff i couldn't imagine <laughs> dealing with all that with also the geckos you already have and everything else you got going on so it's definitely um, a lot of a lot of work and a lot of planning that you had to do to even go into it which i don't think a lot of people even think about like they're just thinking they're gonna you know find a building like throwing the racks and that's pretty much it but there's a lot a lot more to kind of plan and think about when you're when you're building all this stuff or thinking about it and that's not even, you know, thinking about money wise and, you know, the stuff that it costs to like fund an actual build like this. Yeah. And it, when you go into it, you just don't know about anything and you're just trying to, you know, figure it out. And luckily I had a, a neighbor that helped me out with a lot of it. But 
um, you know, getting all the permits for everything and knowing what goes in first and what, you know, you have to, the process, you know, now if I had to do it again, it would be, you know, 10 times easier, but it's, you know, lit knowing how to, you know, run your, your water line in and how to, all these little details you don't, you know, and you got to call the permits at the right time and get people, you know, your, your inspectors in there at the right time. And, you know, another thing we messed up, um, the guy that was helping me too, um, he forgot, we forgot to put an oofer ground, which, you know, most people wouldn't even know what that is, is, you know, you have to have a grounding system for your home or any type of building where um, if you get struck by lightning, it grounds to earth. So oh, wow. we, for, yeah, so they're supposed to run a copper line into your, um, before your concrete's poured on your wall, like your stem walls and everything into like a piece of rebar that connects to everything. So that way it's grounded to earth. Well, right and we forgot to do that and so i had to go and like <laughs> dig a i think it was 20 foot trench that was like like six feet deep and yeah, wow. it was kind of crazy and i had to encase this uh half inch rebar and concrete around it and attach it to a copper line and run it up to my meter base and <laughs> so <laughs> yeah yeah and then you know like probably summertime 2020 that's when it started getting tough to get you know contractors out there and so i was doing you know a lot of work because i had to do it myself you know i did all the hydronic floor heating i did all the, the mini splits i did the um i installed the meter base and ran the the power lines out there i installed the water line um put wow. in a septic tank myself with a drain field and <laughs> a lot of the stuff you <laughs> would never yeah it's you know the government stuff even like you don't even think about like having to want to do or even learn to, to how to do so yeah, you know, you would think, like, I don't need a full septic tank for what I'm doing, but that our house septic tanks on the other side. And so um, in the city or the, I guess the state approves of a 200 gallon tank is the lowest, but they don't approve of any 200 gallon tanks that are made. So the only <laughs> ones they approve of are thousand gallon ones. Like, this is just weird laws on the books there. So. I right. have a way overkill septic tank, but that's all I could put in there, you know, because of the, yeah. the rule, rules behind it. But, yeah, I was like, I'm only going to use like 30 gallons at most a day. <laughs> I don't <laughs> need this massive, you know, septic yeah. tank. But, yeah, it's just, there's a lot, of, a lot of rules and, you know, things that you don't know the first time going in. And it's a learning curve for sure. And that's a, also a good point, um, like permits and dealing with the government on a lot of this stuff because, some of the regulations that are where you're at is going to be totally different from someone on the other side of the country. Um, yeah. And you can't just, you know, if you were to, you know, lay out all your plans to someone and if they were to copy exactly, that might not be what something also will work with someone else, but then also permit wise and with government and based on city laws and county and going up to like state and stuff like that, that's going to be completely different. Um, you're trying to navigate that. Which is another, yeah. and I'm in Idaho, another big so thing. It's, it's it's fairly easy out here compared to most places. But you know, if you're right. in California trying to do something like this, like forget it, <laughs> it's almost <laughs> impossible. You know, so right. Uh, it's yeah. Uh, well, hey, finding real estate. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, you. I don't know. You'd be better off moving out of state at that point for sure. But right. You know. No, that's but, that's yeah. a good good point. So. So there's a lot of hidden costs too and um i mean you, you just you don't realize how much you like i got the price on the building itself like you look at these steel buildings a lot of people will see these advertisements online and stuff and it doesn't seem that bad but you don't realize how much uh concrete cost is a huge expense and especially depending on where you're at you know if you have high winds or anything or high snow loads and stuff but you know you have to have that all engineered you got to pay an engineer to figure it out for you um, and then, you know, the, like, for instance, my, my footers on my, my building were, they had these like pancake, like footers at the bottom. Cause we have high winds and they're like eight feet by eight feet at all the columns on the building. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's way over engineered for sure. It seems like, but it's good because, you know, I don't want to ever want to worry about that. And I even told, you know, the engineer, I like, I'd rather it be over engineered than anything, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Rather be safe than sorry. Yeah, but it's expensive, and it, all those the concrete's very expensive, and you know any t any if you're hiring an electrician, extremely expensive. If you're hiring plumbers, everything's so expensive. So exactly, yeah. Kind of forced. In terms of budgeting, do you think that you went way over what you thought yeah. you were going to spend? Yeah, or? way way over. 
way, way over. And I thought I was going to save a lot doing most of it myself, but you know, I just, it was, that's why partly why it took so long too, it was just trying to find contractors that were good for one. And then, you know, that weren't going to overcharge me in this, you know, in this right now, it's a lot of people are gouging because they, they have, you know, too much work as it is. So they just, you know, they quote you high just to, you know, you, so you leave them alone, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like for instance, my hydronic floor heating, the lowest quote I got was 23,000, you know, and I Whoa. did, I did all the work myself for, you know, probably under 4,000. So, okay. um, you know, you can save quite a bit, you know, if you do at least do some of the manual labor kind of stuff yourself and, um, it just got to that point where I, it was going to take months to get a contractor in there anyway, and I just might as well learn how to do it myself. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You must have all that after all of that, you must have had like a <laughs> vacation. You and your wife needed to go somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I wish. Not yet. <laughs> it's pretty soon. Hopefully. Yeah. Nice. One well, for sure. even in like thinking about that, that building, it must actually, you know, feel good to have it finally done in not have to think about anything else in terms of that for a while or doing as much work as you've already done. You're pretty much at the tail end of everything to have it, yeah. you know, ready and set up to go, which is nice. Yeah. It's getting easier every day. I, I actually, I got 12 more racks from animal plastics when all this started. Um, that's another story in itself, but <laughs> did they get there yet? <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, I ordered them, <laughs> Late 2019, I believe, and I got them finally like May 2021. 20, so, <laughs> wow, yeah, but I mean, that was a big order, but and I wasn't yeah. bugging her too much at first about it, but yeah, they're they're super backed up. But then, even that, like, <clears throat> um, I couldn't get heat tape, you know, I want to use Calorique or um, FlexWatt, um, and they've been I, I ordered in December and I just got it in like two months ago, maybe or a month and a half, yeah, maybe a month ago. thermostats also have been. I don't yeah, know if they're they, back order or what, but well, they just finally herb stats just finally came back up. So okay, um, I'm thinking about grabbing another. I, I ordered a herb stat four from a company, and the guy was like, "Oh, sorry, we don't have any." And we have, I have two herb stat twos though. Um, okay, and I got those instead just in case. But I don't really like using so many thermostats. So like using you know one yeah like a herb stat four is the one I like the most. I don't like the six okay. too much. Um, herbs at four is nice cause it has all the readings on the front and I'm just used to that one. Um, right. but they have some of those up now. So I'm thinking about grabbing another one. Um, okay. but yeah, here, the, uh, the heat tape that took, you know, I ordered that December and I ordered directly from the company and that wow. got here just like last month, I think. And, um, you know, finally put together my last rack this morning. <laughs> so <laughs> Yeah, I'm finally, I think that's the last rack I'll ever have to build. So that's nice. Wow. Yeah, so, I think yeah, now that, now that this is done, what's the next big step? Like, you, you're done with this, the, the build's pretty much done and got everything set up. Was there, you're just going to relax for a while and just focus on geckos? Or do you have anything else that you're planning that you think you're going to add on or in the future or... Where you at no, on that I'm part? still I'm still organizing what's going on out there. I mean, it's still um, I've been having a lot of babies hatch, and so it's really kind of a busy time of year. So um, I'm getting stuff moved over to all the new racks, um, kind of as I go, and trying to organize stuff. And that's going to take a couple months still to kind of get all the way through that. Right. Um, but I'm mostly done with everything on there. So that's a good feeling. Um, there's other personal stuff I want to do. I'm like trying to get a, a welding table set up and other things too. That's kind of separate nice. from geckos, but <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of house projects that have been, you know, set aside for a while and that kind of stuff. But um, okay. yeah, for the geckos, it's mostly just trying to focus and enjoy it again. You know, it's just, uh, it's been tough uh, really with all that work to do and you know moving them over another you know it wasn't like a move like out of state i've been through a few of those of course but yeah um it definitely was still hard you know anytime you got to move your animals over and you know oh, get yeah. them adjusted to a new spot and get things Pain dialed in the way you want yeah so but you know getting that all dialed in exactly the way i want getting it all cleaned out the way i want you know tweaks here and there um you know i should a few more months i should be pretty much there with the geckos at least so nice um and then my whole goal with this whole process has been kind of to 
maybe slow down a little bit on the breeding. I haven't been breeding quite as much the last couple of years and I've actually enjoyed it, you know, not having quite as much of a workload, um, focusing on higher quality stuff and less quantity, um, selling pet geckos, but not trying to blow them out at cheap prices. You know, I, I don't need that much shipping, you know, for one and two, I think it's better for the animals if you're selling them for a little bit higher, you know, most people will take better care for care of them if they actually paid a little bit for them. Right. Um, any excess, I'd probably wholesale after that. Just trying to keep my workload a little less and focus on high end stuff and, you know, go that route more. Mm. Nice. So in terms yeah. of what you have going on, do you even have a season anymore, a set season? Or <laughs> seems like you're yeah. just hatching and breeding all year now. Um, it's still like late uh, summer, mostly for me. It's okay. always been that way. And this year is no change. It may change next year because I've had less, you know, the conditions, um, the shop are now much more controlled and I'm not going to have those big fluctuations quite as much. I mean, I'm going to have to manually do some of those, but, um, yeah, just, uh, yeah, try to focus on, uh, on just keeping that running smooth and, um, yeah, it should, it should, should be about the same. I think in the next couple of years, I think once geckos are kind of like on their set path, um, or they're kind of in that, you know, I don't know. I've just never had a change. Even t anytime I move from spot to spot, it's always been about the same same time of year for all my geckos. Okay. So, I, I I don't know exactly why. It is actually a good thing though, because I usually have geckos later than everybody else, and um, my best months are usually in the the winter, like January, February. So I'm not complaining about it. It's kind of nice to have that late season. Um, but yeah, we'll see. Maybe it'll change this next year. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll, we will see. And even this season, do you think it's been, I don't know, kind of harder to enjoy the geckos or, I don't know, it seems like just a lot of work in terms of the, you know, the building. And then also, like, even though you have, you know, scaled back a little bit, you're still producing a pretty fair amount of geckos and all that stuff. So do you, th you still think you're enjoying the geckos like you have in the past? Or how do you feel like your enjoyment level is with the geckos? Um, I did get burned out for a little while there for sure. Um, and I, I think I got a little more burned out from the community, to be honest, it was just, you know, too much, like after the lemon frost kind of stuff happened and, um, people were blaming me for some reason, like with some of that stuff, I don't know why, but you know, just calling attention to it and people got upset and a lot of friends kind of treated me weird with that, you know, and it was just became polarizing. With the whole issue and i i just was sick of the drama by that point anyway and so you know i kind of had to like reset and get out of it for a little while um and i'm still kind of in that mode where i don't necessarily want to be like you know constantly sharing stuff and in the forums and stuff and or the groups and stuff so um it's just been you know i just try to focus on the animals and you know enjoy that part of it which i always have you know, I don't think I lose that so much, but yeah, the community side of it, some of it, I, I lose interest sometimes. So, right. um, you know, and also I just, the, you have so many other things going on. It's <laughs> just the time yeah. for the drama. Yeah. I just there. didn't have, didn't have time for it. And it was just, you know, it was getting lame and a lot of people would, what would happen. And this is what usually happens with these situations is where I get, you know, tagged into a post where I have no idea what's, you know, the back history between these people. And they've been probably feuding before, or, you know, upset at each other before. And one's calling out another for, you know, mislabeling something. And they come and tag me and say, well, is this, John will know if this is right or wrong. And I get tagged into it. And then I give my opinion, not thinking twice about it. And then all of a sudden I'm, you know, somebody's enemy. <laughs> and it just it never, it just ends up, you know, people dislike you for that for whatever reason. And, you know, they don't understand. And, you know, the, the whole lemon frost was kind of some of that stuff too. And, um, just didn't want to deal with it much anymore. I just put all my information out there and, you know, people can kind of sort that out themselves. And, you know, I just try to work on the quality of my geckos more than anything instead of the, <laughs> the Facebook groups and stuff like that. But, right. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, uh, yesterday, I don't know what's going on, but my Instagram account just, got deleted for whatever reason so um, oh yeah we who knows what's going on with that so um they they basically made me verify some stuff and then i gotta you know petition it or something so i don't know if it That's was crazy. people 
Yeah, I don't post any for sale stuff, anything. I just post pictures and that's it. You know, that's crazy. so um, it's kind of crazy how these companies can just, you know, you know, drop you off the face of the earth like that. And with this, yeah. uh, you know, one person working there or whatever it is. Um, but there may be people, you know, reporting it for whatever reason, you know, probably, you know, animal rights wackos just going through and doing that to everybody. Um, it's going to be a bigger problem going forward, I think, for everybody. It's insane. But, wow. Yeah, hopefully I can get it back up. You know, I had, I think, over 5,000 followers on there. I'm not, I've always, like, been on Facebook more, and I kind of managed my Instagram from Facebook as well um, through the business thing they have there. But, right. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of people, I know a lot of people use Instagram now, and so that's popular with a lot of people. So it kind of sucks to have that, you know, taken away, you know. But, yeah. Who knows? Maybe all animal accounts for Facebook and Instagram, same, you know, same owner for the company. So maybe all those are going to be taken away eventually. Who knows? Yeah. Well, that's really weird, especially because I know you're not selling, you have your own site, so you're not selling animals on there. It's just pictures and no. that's crazy. I, Did they notify you or you just went up there and it was gone? Uh, my wife sent me a message and it was like, you're not on Insta. Did you delete me from Instagram or something like that? And, <laughs> um, it was like, no. And I looked it up and they basically said your account has been taken off or whatever. I don't. Wow. Yeah. It seems like it's probably like an algorithm kind of thing. Like maybe people report it or something like that. And right. You know, cause anybody looking into it would have saw that or would have seen that it would have, it was, there was no, you know, for sale stuff on there. Um, yeah. I read in somebody else's post that had a similar thing happen that they said, like if you were putting male or female on your post, like, for some reason that's fl getting it flagged maybe so okay. like you're kind of selling stuff if you're writing male or female i i sometimes wow. do that so yeah you know, just saying this is my whole back mail from this year or something like that <laughs> right yeah but even then that's not <laughs> you're not selling it or putting prices or anything else on there yeah we'll see hopefully i'm back on but if not i mean the instagram is i don't care that much about it myself but i know a lot of people like to see it on there too so yeah it's one more thing to you know, lose would it yeah. kind of sucks. Right. And well, hopefully that doesn't carry on to Facebook since they're owned by same people. So, well, they, anybody that's been selling, you know, is, I know a few people that have, you know, had for sale posts on Facebook. And I'm surprised they got away with it for so long, but yeah, um, they were still auctioning and doing sales and stuff. And eventually Facebook got rid of them. But yeah, you know, I, I don't really like the auctions on Facebook, so I don't know. I have a mixed feeling about that. I don't want their accounts deleted, but, you know, at the same time, I don't want them necessarily auctioning off geckos on Facebook. Right, kind of, yeah. No, kind of, yeah. Here you. a lot of reasons for that, but. Exactly, yeah. So in terms of this, I don't know, the past two seasons, have you how have you seen, um, just gecko-wise, how have things been in terms of geckos you've been producing, and then also how do you feel that uh, – you know, the hobby's been going. I know that a lot has changed since last time we've talked. Um, so what are, how's the season's been um, the past couple of seasons? And also how have you seen, you know, the hobby kind of changing and just different people and then kind of what you've been seeing on social media and stuff like that? Um, it may be just that I've been kind of out of the scene more um, on, on social media and stuff, but it seems like some of the dramas died down at least, <laughs> but maybe that's just me. <laughs> um, <laughs> It probably probably worse than ever to be honest, but um, yeah, yeah. If you people thought you died, it, so they stopped tagging you in posts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't really answer a lot of that stuff anymore, just because of that. But um, yeah, season's been you know producing better geckos than ever every season. So that's you know um, some amazing stuff this year. Um, I say that every season, I know, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it's true though. So yeah. The cipher stuff yeah. is going well. Um, some cool stuff with that. I'm trying to get it into some other, you know, other morphs and stuff and com new combinations with that. Um, you know, I had the first trimpers. I hatched two trimper albino ciphers this year. Um, a few more bell ciphers, and those are really cool. Um, it's interesting. I need to get pictures of the trimpers updated, but um, really different look than the bells. The bells, mm -hmm. you know. They have, or the trimpers have more of a yellow kind of look and less pattern to them, but they uh, just completely different. So it's really interesting to wow. see. And, and when they hatch out, they were almost completely white, which was very odd too. 
Yeah. Um, Less yeah, color bells. Yeah, very different. The bells have that clear cipher pattern and everything. Like I almost had to second guess on the, the trumper cipher. So, um, yeah, those are really interesting. Um, trying to get snow and white nail on those and <clears throat> some other stuff. But, yeah, it should, that should, that's a work in progress, of course. Um, Firebolds, of course, one of my favorites always. Um, you know, and it's the good thing about the Firebolds, too, is you can just plug them into almost anything and it improves it. You know, there's, I, right. I don't know of anything you breathe that to, you don't improve it. I mean, it, I guess if you get it to a blizzard or something, but. <laughs> you know murphy's pattern this yeah i mean you're not it may even then maybe look better in a murphy or something maybe in a blizzard right. maybe but you know not nothing crazy but any, uh, with those but um any tangerine you breed it to is great you know everything almost so i, I really love that that line um lots of you know there's bell of white and yellows of course are always great um a lot more trimper white and yellows this year some kind of high contrast trimper stuff it's really nice. Uh, some some of the emmering stuff from my line that I've been working on for a few years is really, yeah. you know, picking up and gotten really nice. I mean, everybody wants clown um, G stuff or clowns and stuff, but I don't know. It's just not even <laughs> comparable to like some of the, it's crazy because I'll, I'll produce a clown and everybody wants it. And then, you know, I produce one that's way better than the line that I'm working on just because I don't have a fancy name on it. Nobody gets too excited. So <laughs> this is the way it goes, though. And I think you need to be, you know, half marketing, you know, to really bring out a lot of these lines. But right. I, I just always subscribe to keeping the geckos as nice as possible, you know, first. Yeah. Very cautious about, you know, naming something new. It's really hard for me to do that sometimes. Yeah. So. I know it took you a while to even just name the purple heads. <laughs> yeah, it just kind of was the nickname for them for a long time. And finally, I just yeah. said, whatever, you know, everybody's calling them that because it's the nickname of them. And, um, you know, Matt is the one actually, I think, originally said that. He, and it was just not even, he wasn't trying to name it either. He was just saying, like, oh, you, those purple head ones you have on your website or something like that. And he was talking about them. <laughs> and I think I talked to him again. I was like, yeah, the purple head ones you were talking about. And, you know, over time, it just, just kind of snowballed. kept going. <laughs> yeah, just kept going. And, you know, they, everybody's, you know, some people are like, it doesn't have a purple head, though. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> well, white and yellow isn't literally white and yellow either. Right. But, you know, some people uh -huh. don't get how things are named and the way yeah. they come about sometimes clowns so, aren't rainbow <laughs> yeah they're not well they can kind of look a little bit but you know they're not yeah the extreme right. marines and stuff like that they're not necessarily green or whatever but yeah yeah well it's been a been a good good year for sure i have a lot of, i'm probably going to be posting an update tomorrow or the next day that's the plan at least um so nice. it'll probably be the biggest okay. update of the year um, I don't know when you're going to air this, but, um, yeah, so probably the 21st or 22nd, I'll be, uh, posting a big update and, you know, there's only a couple of days for shipping left this season anyway, but you know, yeah. um, yeah, I'll just be able to get a few out. Um, okay. yeah. And then, you know, usually January is when I start picking up a lot. Okay. Yeah. But, See, yeah. Cause you're you're kind of later so i think when a lot of people are kind of selling over the summer and that's kind of their peak i think you take you know really good opportunity of that you know kind of later winter fall winter season where that's when you have a lot of your better stuff for sale um that you're able to offer yeah and so you know yeah it's just all the way always the way it's been and you know every year i, I think i've told this to a few breeders too it's like every year my best seat, best months are january february march typically so um for sales um i'm producing most of the stuff in the summer but i just kind of like to hold stuff back a little bit i don't need to sell it too young i don't need to sell it unsexed and you know yeah sometimes you 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 sell something too cheap or sometimes you sell it too high you know if you sell it too early so you know i mean my bigger fear is to sell it for too much and the person's upset which can happen if you you know some geckos look amazing when they're young um and over time, you kind of really, you kind of learn how different lines will develop. Uh, for instance, purple head lines can look horrible till you know twenty, thirty grams sometimes even, and then all of a sudden they pop and they really look great. Um, you know, 
the firebolds kind of you know they're bold when they're young of course but then they don't really get their color till later as well most tangerines are that way but you know right. just knowing when to sell stuff and you know that way you you sell it you don't undercut yourself and you don't you know make anybody upset that get something you know you price it too high yeah i think that's something i've seen a little bit more on kind of the social media side of things where people are kind of selling the you know even 10 gram geckos and shipping those out or you know posting stuff on sex and stuff like that but i know you kind of have always done things a little bit differently where you wait until they're you know 25 30 grams before you even post them up and stuff like that or don't don't really do you know anything where you're holding stuff out or like taking money on geckos that um haven't even hatched yet and stuff like that that we're kind of starting to see nowadays yeah and if you get yourself in that situation too you can you know sometimes something doesn't thrive it gets to 15 grams or so and then it doesn't thrive as quite as well and you want it something like 30 grams thriving typically you know is a better way to go a lot of times um, even people that sell like stuff at like 10 grams or something, that's, you know, it's a crapshoot for the, whoever is buying that sometimes, you know, so um, especially after shipping that young, most geckos would be fine, of course, um, but there's always a certain percentage that won't take it too well. Um, so I like to see something doing really well. I know it's robust and healthy and thriving, you know, and you can tell that with some of the younger stuff too. Like when I sell the younger ones, it's the ones that are growing the fastest typically. Um, right. And I like it. Maybe it's a snow or something where I know it's not going to change too much in color or anything like that. So it's kind okay. of a set set price or Diablo Blanco. Really, it's going to just stay white anyway. So that's pretty simple. But yeah, you can nice. you don't want to sell stuff too young and you know have people upset with you later. And there's no real exactly. reason real reason to anyway. So so in terms of projects and stuff like that, I know you have kind of a lot of a lot of cool things that are coming into fruition i know one of the big things um that a lot of people have been excited about is uh red diamond stuff that you've been working with um then also just your your white and yellow albinos um so are you kind of just gonna continue on the direction um with those with those things or you have anything exciting with those projects that you have coming up um that you're planning for this next season yeah i'm i'm working with the the red diamonds like the pure line quote unquote um but I'm also mixing them up. I think there is some probably, you know, closed off genetics on those. They need to be, um, you know, outcrossed a little bit. So I'm working on some various crosses. I've sold some of the stuff, but, you know, I had some crosses with firebolts and, you know, which was kind of an obvious cross to do with them. Um, some of my high, high contrast tangerine stuff. I had some red stripe crosses with them and some um, white and yellow crosses with them. So few different things they're definitely a very nice line very you know um, high demand for sure but um, yeah really nice tendering trimpers it's just you always getting the same problem with something that's almost too good to be true where you know if you go too far with it you may be inbreeding too much so um, right. I haven't really seen too much in my stuff I know other people have um, you know but sometimes males for some reason don't grow quite as fast but then once they're older they tend to do fine and they breed fine so um i you know that's hard to say if you know some some things with the lines we expect them to you know just eat and be super big the first year and that's not what they do in the wild either so it's hard to it's hard to know what's unhealthy or what's inbred too much sometimes but i think it's right. a good idea to probably outcross them a little bit um it came they came out of you know from a fairly smaller breeder so i'm probably he probably doesn't have too many geckos into them um and crossed into them so okay. um when people are breeding babies from the babies they got from him that maybe you know siblings or whatever you start getting into you know closing it off too much i think um right and the i think you said the white and yellow trimpers yeah i got you know i haven't had too many of those i was always trying to clear out the white nail syndrome from trimper to be 100 percent on it and i finally got some that i'm you know i'm sure that are don't have that issue with them anymore um but the problem with the, that white nail syndrome is that you know it's not going to affect their health too much typically it could be something very minor it's not like enigma or anything but it, you know you don't want it in the line um and it can skip generations, which is makes it tough for clearing them of that problem. So 
you could have, you know, even two generations sometimes and you won't see it unless you have enough numbers. So um, I sort of feel also you'd like to add to what I've said in the past about white and yellow syndrome. I sort of feel like there's some other gene that like that goes with it that creates that issue. Like, like, I think if you bring back that gene, whatever it is, um, and you cross it with white and yellow, that it actually could, you know, have the syndrome again. So interesting but okay. yeah i don't i don't know for sure on that that's just a I'm, it's a possibility I, I think i've had some stuff that like didn't have any of it for sure and then i crossed it into something and i had a couple babies that would have it and it was just like there's something that's adding to it that's causing this and then i've had non-white nails have the syndrome too so i mean i think it may be just random sometimes as well so okay has it been related to white and yellow, like white and yellow siblings and stuff that you've seen that with, or just completely different lines too? Yeah, completely different lines and white and yellow. Well, the, that syndrome thing would affect white and yellow siblings as well. Um, for whatever reason, with the white and yellow gene, I think it comes out more. It, it just shows more. Um, but uh, I think with the white and yellow syndrome, it... Sorry, my dog. Can you hear my dog? <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's background. Just stop. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, you know, the siblings, it can show a little bit. But um, yeah, it's it's not quite as much with the, the actual white and yellow itself, um, which made that was originally kind of the reason I thought it was separate as well. And then also my bell line. I've never seen one white gecko with white and yellow syndrome ever in that whole line. And I've produced, really? I mean, there's thousands of them out, out there now. I've, I've produced hundreds many hundreds um, and never seen it once. So I knew it could be separated and then I did separate it out a few times, but you know, I, I feel like if you, there's, there's some genetic trade out there or something that if you bring that back to it for whatever reason, it could cause that issue again. But I don't okay. know, that's my theory at the moment. <laughs> it's evolving. Yeah, but it's super hard because not everything with leverage because they're cutting dry. I think a lot of people, uh, you know, think they could go to your, I don't know, your genetics page and <laughs> figure out everything there is to know about leopard gecko genetics. Um, and it is really, you know, great for people to learn as a resource, but I think people try to find out everything they can about lemon frost and enigma and all these, you know, genes that we have and even stuff that, you know, we don't know that might pop up later. Um, but I think when you're, when you're working with animals, there's not everything that you could find out a hundred percent from the start. So, yeah. And then one thing to know is all these things aren't absolutely equal. They're not all, you know, the same. Like a lot of people like to put lemon frost and enigma in the same category, which they're probably, you know, from an ethics standpoint, probably about the same. I would say lemon frost is probably the worst, though, since what, it, you know, the severe disease that it causes. Um, but you could argue that enigma could be just as bad because it causes a deterioration of their health um and a lot of geckos don't eat enough and you know that can happen no matter what but it's just much more pronounced in limit or in enigmas but even if you have like the worst white and yellow syndrome gecko i mean it's nothing usually compared to the you know a bad or normal enigma case so um, all right it's not all the same you know i don't think you should be breeding white and yellow syndrome geckos it's not what i'm saying but you know <laughs> from a quality of health or health standpoint or ethics standpoint, it's not the same there. Um, and there's like the nor or black eye gene or whatever. Um, you know, that's another one that's questionable. It's like, where do you fall on that? Because technically they're, yeah, they're more sensitive to light. They have a little harder time eating. It seems like, but you can almost make the same argument that an albino has that issue too. Um, I've had quite a few that eat fine and you know, I've never really had, had problems with them eating so they figure it out um is their health or is that causing them pain of any sort i mean it, we, we're, we're speculating on that so i i've chosen not to breed them now at this point um there's a little bit too much debate on it and it's not necessary to breed them so all the gecko genetic stuff i have now is doesn't have that in it but i keep a couple of just the test breed if necessary like if to see if the gene is in there and if i produce hats from it it's not going to you know produce that that issue, but um, it's definitely not as bad as an enigma or, or lemon frost in that case. So that's what I'm right. the main point is that you can't just say this is bad and this is equally as bad. There, there's there's a gradient there for sure. 
So exactly. some of it's yeah. some of it's hard to navigate. You know, some people want to breed curly tail geckos and um, some people think that's horrible. And I don't do it myself. And I'm not going to I don't really have a big opinion on it. I don't think most of that's going to be genetic anyway. But, you know, some people want to breed, you know, runt geckos or small geckos and try to produce smaller ones and some want to produce you know overfeed their super giants a lot of these a lot of these things are are ethical issues to some extent you know i fell you know breeding a super giant and feeding it you know to for maximum weight and that thing dies in a couple of years from fatty liver disease i think that's an ethical issue too so i mean there's lots of there's lots of balancing on the fence with some of this stuff so exactly yeah i think also when you go towards like some of the things that we have now in terms of genetics there's so many awesome things we have cypher obviously white yellow is awesome when you don't have any issues along with it and there's so many awesome cool stuff that you could use marble eye eclipse without issues so like what's the point of using you know stuff that has issues and could cause that stuff down the line yeah i mean i i'm overloaded and this is all i do and I mean, for for me to be overloaded with stuff that's, you know, you don't have to question yourself on that with, you know, it's there's plenty out there to work with. And I don't even work with everything I could. There's a lot of projects I would consider working with, but it's just, you know, I don't need to, you know, add more to, to what I already have. I've got too much on my plate as it is. Exactly. You don't have time to be on social media all day. So anybody uh, listening, don't check. Don't tag John. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not saying that. But I don't. Yeah. Don't tag me into drama. That's all I can. <laughs> like, don't have a fight with somebody and then you know say use me as the, you know, your argument from authority or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> just I'm not there to play judge and jury. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> judge John on the scene. <laughs> yes, exactly. So people think that I'm gonna you know set them straight and then the other person's pissed at me and then you know. There's some weird, I mean, there's a lot of great people in this hobby and there's some, some strange people too. And some people that take things the wrong way and hypersensitive and, you know, online, everybody gets a little bit more upset than if you talk to them in person, you know, I think half the conversations get, you know, mixed up and, you know, people don't really understand your intention when you're saying something. So they take it as a threat, especially when they have already been, you know, in a, you know, confrontational situation with somebody else they'll <laughs> do the same to you right exactly yeah and you've been in it long enough to know how you know people could be stirring up drama especially on social media and then also a lot of those people won't be here in a couple of years so <laughs> then the next yeah you know, most of them drama will, people. it's that's fine i mean it's you know some people it's not for them of course and um but yeah it's most people won't and you will never see them again so what's the, what's the point <laughs> All right, exactly. No point in wasting time in drama that'll no one will remember a couple months from now. <laughs> yeah, most of that. I mean, if you knew the drama that happened like 2015, 16, 17, I mean, you'd be surprised how much there was. And most of it's, you know, most people don't even know about it anymore. So, all right. Yeah. That's There's no point in worrying about it all day. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's all about the geckos anyway. So mm -hmm. if you're not focusing on the gecko and you're here to deal with drama and that's geckos are just the way for that then <laughs> it's not the hobby for you <laughs> yeah yeah and there's always going to be somebody that wants to you know clean up enigmas or you know try to outcross lemon frost or whatever it is and you know it's there's always going to be that person that wants to do that and thinks they're scientifically minded and they may have great intentions that's fine but you know it's like the, the problem is that that person is in it for a couple of years and they realize that they were wrong and then there's a new person in a couple of years that wants to start the same thing over there's not a ton of documentation out there about everything maybe um maybe there should be better documentation about specific numbers of stuff but i mean i can near guarantee any of these people saw the stuff that i saw you know on almost a daily basis at that time it's like you would not have ever questioned like like what what these genes were doing to animals you know right it's, i mean it's it's pretty cut and dry like once you know you've seen it enough and you know like i mean a lemon frost is simple i mean both of them are simple but you know lemon frost is like it just the more outcrossing you do it seems like 
the one thing that seems to affect it is that the more tangerine you have in the line, which kind of makes sense because the yellow color causes, causes those iridophoroma cells or um, tumors, the higher, the higher um, pigment or light, lighter pigment, basically, the more of those cells are there. And so you have an imbalance of those, it was causing tumors and, you know, hypos and tangerines look you know, like they, they probably have higher numbers of those cells. So, um, you know, you add that lemon frost to it and you're going to cause tumors almost every time, whereas you cross it into something darker like a black knight or, you know, even bile types or something, you're probably going to get a few less. But what happens when you sell that to somebody and they cross it to another tangerine and, you know, all of a sudden you got that, that, those pigment cells back in there, you know? So, yeah. I mean, the two lemon frosts that I got were crossed to two different tangerine lines and then I crossed them to two completely outcrossed tangerine lines. And every, like almost every one of the babies from those were showing tumors. I mean, those are out crossed quite a bit, wow. you know? Um, and then, you know, first generation wild type crosses still showing it, you know, never saw one on a sibling from, you know, hundreds and hundreds of these. So yeah. it's pretty, pretty obvious where it's coming from. And then there's just the science tells you that it was just those, those types of cells, the same thing that made it look good, you know, was causing the, the issue. But. Yeah. And then also it comes to the point where it's like, even if you are doing that, how many baby geckos does it take or in general yeah. to, to show you that, you yeah, know, it was an issue. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's already been probably hundreds of thousands produced that have, you know, have been, you know, where are they at? Where are they now though? That's the thing. How many of these pets are out there and how many of, you know, we have seen pictures of some of them that are developed really horrible tumors, but. You know, yeah. that's only the pictures we've seen. How many are out there? Nobody even showed anybody, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And, and how many wow. four or five year old lemon frosts do you see out there <laughs> still? Yeah. And there may healthy. be some that are fine. That's not the point. The point is that there's a high percentage of them that are not. And right. they're causing yeah. issues. And the extreme cases are very extreme. Um, and so it just, you know, a lot of people, it took them a while to come around to it for some reason. I don't you know, whatever their motives were. I think a lot of people wanted it to be true so bad that they were willing to look past some of the things. But if anybody wanted it to be a good morph, it was me. I had a lot invested in them at the time. Um, you know, I had really cool offspring from some of my fireball crosses, which I would have had, you know, some of the best ones out there at that time. Um, yeah. the reason I even Especially the tangerine paid. ones too. Yeah, I mean, tangerines were being done for sure, but some of those fireball ones are amazing, and I don't think anybody else is crossing them to at least as nice a fireball. So, they were, it's a, it was a really cool morph. It sucks that it went that way, but can't deny it either. You know, it is what it is. All right. So when it came to something like Cypher, obviously that popped up in your collection. How sure were you to make sure the? <laughs> obviously, you didn't want a something that was a two point of that version. So. Yeah. How did you well, make sure I mean, that? It says anything. Good. I produced the first ones in 2015, and I didn't sell them until um, was it this year or is it, yeah, last year? 2020. Last year, <laughs> yeah, 2020. Yeah. <laughs> Getting even the years mixed up. It's all blur. <laughs> it's um, all one blur. Yeah. Uh, so you know, five years even selling when I've already hatched visuals. So I mean, that wow. tells you. Um, even four years it. before you know people even knew. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't tell anybody there. for a long time. I wanted to make sure it was good. And then also I just, you know, I, I was quiet about it and making sure I, everything was good, trying to get ahead on some projects with it. And then, um, you know, I'm not breeding enough of them to really, you know, like totally take over the market or anything. I'm like, and the problem with them too is that like I can't spend that much time on that project because I got so many other things going on. So, um, right. yeah, they there's a lot to be done with them. A lot of stuff I haven't done and a lot of stuff I probably won't even do, but it'll be exciting to see all the different things that come out of them. Yeah. Um, based on what I've seen, there's some, you know, already interesting stuff. The fireball crosses are kind of pretty cool already. You know? Oh yeah, for sure. So, Especially yeah. since they're recessive too, it's going to take a lot more time than lemon frost or enigma dominant. So anything you cross it to 50% of the babies going to have that trait. So it takes a lot more yeah. work. Then. yeah it's a little it's a little slower going but you know it's it that's makes it more valuable in a way you know everybody can blow out something real quick you know when it's a dominant but 
um, visa will take longer to get them into all the different morphs and stuff. And people have a chance to do that. I can't do it all for sure. You know, I finally right. got them into snows this last year. Like it's taken me that long to do that. So, um, in white and yellows as well. So I haven't produced a visual yet in either one of those, but you know, it'll be interesting. And some of those ones that miles is hatching out as well. Like, I, I mean, they're possible ciphers, you know, it's got a little, I think, I don't know how much, he's shared publicly about that stuff but um i don't want to overstep on that but you know potentially if those are ciphers some of those interesting things he's got you know who knows so right uh, yeah it could be some real wild stuff coming from those when they're crossing the other stuff i mean the tremper yeah. one was you know that was wild when it hatched out oh, it was yeah. completely white you know i never would have thought that <laughs> exactly yeah so who knows how it's going to react to some of these other other genes that you add in there especially i think the you know firebolt route and even the tangerine route kind of adding some of those line bread traits too those are super cool long-term projects where people could really get you know a nice head start on and really add some cool stuff to those lines as well yeah i'll be interested in uh i have some uh, unfortunately i only produced male black knight crosses last year and so i wasn't able to produce any of those with 50 percent blood but um, it'll be interesting to see some of those darker morphs, like the, the melanistics and then, you know, bolds, I think are going to be really cool with those. Cause that band on the back of the cipher, I think it acts kind of like the bands on a regular gecko. So on these wild types of stuff, it breaks up and disappears over time. And so they kind of don't keep that. But I think once you get a bold in there, pretty, pretty good, it's going to keep that band. Um, so the complete backstripe on it, um, nice. all the way through, which will be nice too. So okay cool. uh, in terms of uh i know uh mar it came from kind of marbleized stuff so um yeah. do you think you're pretty close to getting marble eye out of there um with some of the stuff that you're working on i'm sure i have some that are don't have marble eye in them um, it's just testing point. pretty much yeah at, at this point unless i test every single male that i have it's it's just it's a little bit hard so i've been what i've been trying to do more is um, cause it came out of the pure marbleized stuff. I tried to outcross them to other things that are not het for anything. And then try to, I'm going to probably tr test those males and get to the, already to the point where the percentage of chance of marbleized is already really low. So that way, when I test, I'm not wasting my time, like, you know, testing four males or three, even if you test three males, it's a lot of work even for myself. Right. So testing them against that many marbleized and making sure about it. So if I can get to the point where, um, you know, I, I, the percentage is already low and then I'm, you know, I can probably test two males and be pretty sure on one of them, at least, you know, most likely. So it, it, it's right. probably there already. It's just a matter of test breeding enough, you know? Exactly. Yeah. And even with, you know, all your projects, you can't even put all the energy in rack space with just a hundred percent cypher stuff. So yeah, it's you have a yeah. ton of other projects going on too. Yeah, and I mean, the market's only going to demand so much from one breeder, so I'm not going to try to overproduce them either. I want other people to be able to produce them, and I don't necessarily want to, like, that. the variety is what makes this fun. You know, if you're only producing one thing, like, even people that do just, like, one albino strain, it, it does get boring after a while, and that's why they usually add more, you know. Um, so, it. You can do that for so so long, but you kind of you eventually buckle and <laughs> and uh, get some more albino strains, and then you have to have every morph there is, and you know, go from there. Right. But, yeah. So even from your standpoint, I know you um, you kind of talked about your size, and I think 2017 or 2018, you had that really big year where you produ produced a ton of geckos. Um, yeah. Do you think you're wanting to expand or kind of take the the size that you're at now or where do you think you want to stay size wise um probably the same as i am now or downsize a little i i i want to produce a higher quality and less um the the number game is it's tough for one uh, the work that's involved if you do it right it's a ton of work um i i prefer dealing with less customers and you know higher quality like all around like people want to spend that money and breeders and it's just an easier i mean nothing against pet owners and stuff but they're a lot more work and it's a it's a lower price gecko and 
um, I want to do more of the higher end stuff and keep that going, which is what I'm kind of at right now. Um, so I'm not trying to expand anymore and I kind of get burned out, um, pretty quick. Um, you know, 2017, I was having to move and, you know, I had a big, I went to Tinley that year. And, um, so I had, had a, it produced quite a few that season and that burned me out quite a bit, especially after when I had to move in 2018, right after that. So. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily want to repeat that anytime soon, at least. Yeah. So, <laughs> Especially yeah. after all that work you put on that shop. <laughs> yeah. It's, I just want to take a little breather, if anything. So I'm doing fine now. So. Right. Nice. And in terms of your projects, I know you do work with pretty much every morph and have a ton of different projects and different lines going on there. So where do you kind of put your time and effort now and kind of deciding there's ton of like things that you see in the market where it's like things will get hot for a while and then cool back down and so where do you see yourself in terms of like projects and really how do you decide what to put your time in with so many options on the market now these days i usually i try to i'm trying to listen to customers more now like there's you know people are um, wanting specific things and then i try to keep that in mind as the year goes on um, about what i'm producing um, i usually start off each season um producing trying to produce a little bit of everything and usually i get a decent variety but i also won't produce like one specific thing if if you know a couple pairings don't work out so um you know i didn't produce many afghanicus this year i didn't even produce any hard wiki or fuscus this year um angermani are still doing good i actually finally produced some choga and um, some more misjed so those are good, which I didn't produce last season. So there's ups and downs with every season with everything. Um, so I, I, I ideally produce a few of everything. And then like some of the key things that people want more, like fire bolts and bold stripes and tangerines, like produce a little more of those. Um, but for most part, I just try to keep the variety. It keeps me, you know, keeps the fun for me. And then, you know, a lot of people, you know, they're willing, when I have 20, extreme bold females and you know it, the price kind of goes down at that point or people are not willing to spend as much or whatever and you know i want to keep the value in all these things it's not just about the money it's about the value of these animals you know staying high for everybody out there and right. i just want to also quality it. too yeah I'm trying to keep the quality as high as possible and so <clears throat> my whole thought process going forward is i'm going to be keeping a lot of breeders still i could probably produce you know 5,000 babies if I bred every one of my adults and I maximized them and, you know, paired the males back in with them over and over and, you know, pulled every egg like immediately and was really on top of it. But I just don't want to produce that many. So I, I like keeping the variety and having extra breeders when I want something. I don't have to like, you know, rely on one male for one year. So I like to have backup males on everything um, and just having that that ability to choose which ones I want to breed each season. And sometimes I want to give a female a break for a season. Um, don't want to be just pumping eggs out every season. That's, I don't, I think it's good to give them a little bit of a break. Um, sometimes even males too, they, you know, they usually try to pair each male up maybe once, but you know, sometimes I, you know, cut that down too, but you know, yeah. sometimes I'm limited by, the males I have and you know sometimes if you, you try to move them around to too many females it's just too much and they end up producing a lot of duds so um try to less less you know less females per male um going forward more males and more variety to do with that and it also helps with genetics too so if I only have you know two fireball males for instance and I, that's all I use and the babies I'm selling you know everybody's you know usually getting most of them like they'll get a pair from me and they can't you know they're breeding those and they're a little more inbred you know and so if i have seven eight males instead and i only you know i breed one per female or you know two females per male um i can keep the genetics a little more diverse as well so yeah it's a little i think a little better way to do it for what i'm doing the more high-end stuff right especially i think even when it comes to like backup males is a good good point you mentioned when you're test breeding things and making sure that you have you know the right genetics for those things if you only put you know one cornerstone male that you're using for all this stuff there's 
kind of issues that you could get in if especially if you're like something like you if you had just one firebolt male and i know firebolt is a big thing for you and the different lines you have with that if you kind of went a year without fireballs that'd be <laughs> pretty bad yeah i don't oh, think i'll be. ever i don't think i'll ever not breed those but um yeah having backups is always always a good idea and you'll have some years where you'll have a male that just won't do anything for you like no matter how many females you pair them with i had a really awesome fireball mail from last year that just i think i got like three good eggs out of them and i paired them to like five females and that was wow. kind of a bummer <laughs> you know i bred them to my nicest female but that happens every year with something you know so right. you, sometimes you know new breeders or people jumping in a little too quick they kind of think that it's just going to be you know super easy every year and maybe you'll be lucky and you'll get a lot of good pairings and things work out but you know if something doesn't breed that's normal you know it's kind of, I think there's few reptiles where people get upset as much as, you know, with leopard geckos, where if something doesn't produce like right away for them and, you know, especially with limited experience, you know, so, um, I mean, I could imagine somebody doing this with bows where they get upset at the breeder because their, their bows didn't produce or something. Cause it's just, you know, so much more difficult. Um, right. so it's like when you sell a gecko to somebody, I mean, if you're planning to breed, you kind of need to know and have these expectations that not everything's going to work out a hundred percent, especially if you're brand new. So, you know, don't get mad at the breeder when something doesn't produce. And like, if I buy an expensive gecko from another breeder and it doesn't produce for me the first year, I don't go back to him and get mad. You know, that's just the way it goes. Exactly. Yeah, he, even me. So. Yeah, I think that's another good point. People have kind of unrealistic expectations where they think they're going to get a gecko and, you know, even if they do pay a lot of money for it and they think they're going to get 12 babies out of that one gecko, um, if it's a female and stuff like that. But it's just not realistic that I think a lot of people, it takes a lot of years to get to that point. Like you didn't start breeding geckos <laughs> last year and then get to the point where you're building a shop and getting all these awesome worms that you're producing now. It kind of goes over time and it's not something that, you know, you get overnight or even in a couple seasons. Yeah. People need to manage their expectations a little better. And it's not a big uh, get rich quick scheme. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're not breeding geckos to get rich and <laughs> no. move I to never, Hawaii. No, <laughs> this is much pain and suffering. Trust me. <laughs> like a lot of better ways to make a ton of money. That's for sure. Yeah. But, yeah. Especially, Actually, but at the same time I'm at home and, um, I have a lot of free time too and I make my own schedule and things like that those things are those things are big pluses in my book because I've worked the corporate world before and <clears throat> I could never go back to that so there's there's always good things and negative things with everything so right yeah I think it just kind of takes the the person to kind of find out what they want I think you know they see your collection and they're like oh even if they do kind of spend the money on that sort of collection it's not something that's guaranteed uh, to happen overnight um it's kind of just unrealistic expectations to have that idea that someone's going to come in one one year and then just you know make a ton of money um and do it that way so and even if you produce them i mean it's that's only half the battle but you know maybe even less than half because you gotta still take pictures of them they're good quality you gotta get them up there and put your name out there somehow that people recognize you and that they trust you you know the problem is there's a lot of people that you shouldn't trust and so the good people get, you know, mixed up in that and it's a hard to break through, you know, um, a lot of the loudest people out there, a lot of breeders sometimes are the ones you probably want to trust the least. And some of the ones that are cautious about it and, you know, really take their time and are careful about their genetics and not trying to, you know, oversell and market their stuff. A lot of times those are the geckos you want to buy, but, um, it's a balance, you know, and it, that's, it's a hard thing to overcome, you know, getting your own website, you know, now I think morph market's a good thing for a lot of people coming out. Like I definitely would have started, you know, if I had issues with sales, I'd go there. But, um, I used to rely on fauna back in the day when, when things weren't doing as well on my website. And so whenever I had extra time because I wasn't selling as much, I'd go to advertising and, you know, back and forth. But, um, right. Yeah. With, Facebook cutting down on sales and stuff like that. And it looks like Instagram too. And so it's, uh, it's, it's tough to, to get it out there for, you know, to, to make yourself known with everybody else out there. Yeah. For people who are trying to get started into, you know, 
kind of go the route where it's you know more about the geckos than anything i think that's where you we're seeing a lot of people kind of go towards where they see the drama or they've been in it for a while and they don't want to deal with any of that um what do you think is kind of a good way to kind of go about breeding or just focusing on the geckos and really just ignoring everything else or the politics that kind of go with breeding and everything else Mm, and just you got to take your time i mean if you're just getting into reptiles and this is like your starter like you're gonna it's gonna be a long road for sure i mean if you've done you know kept leopard geckos and uh, other reptiles before it's going to be a lot easier for you um but just take your time and go slow and like once you're comfortable with what you have and you know try to make smart decisions about you know the size you want to be and you know each year what you want to produce and you know don't get yourself in over your head about stuff. I mean, I think everybody says this, but you know, it's, it's really true. You just can't overdo it at first. You know, and a lot of times you feel like you'll have some success at the beginning and you'll think, wow, I got this down. It's so easy. I've watched all those Sasso Beck videos and it's, you know, he makes it look so simple. And, um, <laughs> it's not only that it's really, like I said, the website yeah. and the selling and a lot of people, end up with a lot of babies they can't sell or they don't know how or they don't know what to price them at and they you know, aren't taking the best pictures and they really are you know shipping is very intimidating at first for a lot of people um i know it was for me when you first start shipping you're like you know you're scared to death at first but you know it slowly over time gets easier but um even to this day i, I worry with shipping it's stressful for sure you know you're trying i drop them off at the ship center so i'm you know balancing you know packaging them up as late as possible yet not trying to be too late to miss the the cutoff time and the traffic and everything you worry about stuff like that and so shipping is a lot of work too you know all the heat every every situation is different every shipment i ship out i mark down the weather you know at the hubs and the delivery times and the, um the highs and lows of that place and then trying to get it right with the heat packs and the you know usually I, I don't use cold packs too much anymore but um using cryo packs effectively and knowing how to use them right um using heat packs correctly knowing that you know little things like different heat packs you can get a batch of heat packs that's 10 degrees hotter than the, the batch before it you know a lot of people don't realize that right. there's that much a difference in especially lately for whatever reason the last couple of years the heat packs have been very inconsistent but um like i i literally have two boxes of heat packs here two big cases of them and one i label as cold and one is labeled as hot because <laughs> one is it probably gets the max 95 degrees and the other one gets wow. about one 115 or something you know wow. <laughs> so it, th there's a it's a mixture if they make that mixture in there and add too much moisture or whatever it is and that mixture it's it just changes everything with the those heat packs so yeah even little things like that and you know it, it's tough and you you'll you have a lot of lessons along the road so, so. I would I would say just take slow, try to read and learn as much as you can, and um, I mean if you really love it, you'll you'll keep learning and you'll keep going for it. If you don't, you're gonna get you're gonna lose interest, and that'll be it. But at least you're not you know putting a bunch of animals in jeopardy, and it's easier to sell off of you know a small collection rather than a large one. So exactly, yeah, and yeah, just the small things that a lot of people don't think about. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. messages is another big one <laughs> responding to but uh yeah especially when you get you probably gone the same questions a thousand times and <laughs> writing the same yeah. answer over and over again <laughs> oh i have a big note thing in my email where i have like categories of what the questions are about and then i have like copied and paste like answers. Copy paste. And I, I tweak them usually <laughs> right but there's certain things like you know somebody asked me about shipping to canada or shipping to you know wherever or they ask me at like different days of the week when i'm planning on shipping and telling them you know specifically those days and you know qu different questions that are commonly coming up and they're usually when i've written out an answer that i think is you know coherent and a good answer you know sometimes i'm waking up in the morning and barely able to you know figure out what's going on and you know rather than just trying to type up something like that i have like or answers kind of labeled out and i'll tweak them a little bit but yeah you, you hear a lot of the same stuff i don't get it quite so much as i used to because i try to make my website very complete with all that stuff and i can almost always just link somebody to a page on my website 
Um, you know, there's, if you, if you don't, I mean, it has to be fairly advanced question. Um, if it's not on my website. So most of that stuff, I, I weed out that way, but I mean, I don't, I want to answer emails, but I want people to do their homework too. You know, there's a, it's, it's a little frustrating when people ask me the most simple questions and it's, you know, it's like, come on, <laughs> you know, I mean, you're taking care of people don't like to read these days. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I, I don't know how to compare it, but you know, I wouldn't email like a dog breeder and just be like, I don't know. It's like, do I need to feed it puppy food or I don't know. <laughs> it's like simple <laughs> questions. Like it probably gets all the time, but right. Yeah. Or I think that's just basic, you know, research. You don't, I don't know have a baby at the hospital then ask the doctor what do i feed it <laughs> how do i take care of this thing <laughs> yeah i mean i, I yeah. get it some people you want to be spoon fed you know and that would come from that kind of culture right now where a lot of people just want to be told everything and we got a lot of information on our hands and you know kind of gets overwhelming but i mean for you know youtube or something like you can look up 20 videos on any subject for the most part and usually get kind of a clear answer on that. And, right. you know, my care sheet goes over pretty much everything. And I'd be almost always the main thing is just don't get the supplementation wrong. And then well, as long as you don't do that, you're kind of fine <laughs> with leopard geckos. Right. Exactly. Like, that's the only thing people screw up that can be a long-term issue for the most part, besides like pairing males together and doing other stuff is <laughs> obvious but right yeah yeah now in terms of the market right now um i think just these past couple of years have been really interesting and in seeing how the market's going and um i don't know just as the hobby um i know you haven't been on social media as much but where do you kind of see the hobby going now um i think the market has been kind of really amazing um better than you know it has been in the past but where do you do you see this kind of staying like this i know it's kind of hard to judge but just your judgment and you've been in it for a while. How do you think the hobby is going and where it's going right now? Um, well, I think it's, there is a, I think the market's been unbelievable this last couple of years. And it's kind of amazing to me with everything that's happened that it's still this, you know, people, you know, go, go into a pandemic with, you know, one of the things that they want to buy is a leopard gecko, but <laughs> I'm focused mostly online and I think a lot of people, the shows got canceled for one. And so, um, I think everybody turned online to, to buy most of their geckos at that point that, that wanted them. So I think that was a plus. Um, yeah, the market's been great. The only other issue though, is, you know, for me as a breeder, getting supplies and getting, you know, um, the cost of everything has gone up quite a bit. Um, you know, so there has been inflation with everything, you know, it's just, everything's cost more now. Um, everything from my cocoa fiber, um, like, uh, all the, the types of hides and stuff I use, everything I use pretty much has gone up for the most part in price. And a lot of stuff has been very difficult to, you know, sometimes stuff goes out of stock or supply chain issues. And so most, most things that I use, I've ordered six, seven months in advance. Like if you saw how many paper towels I have right now, you would <laughs> you'd laugh because it's just, it's a kind of ridiculous, but it's like, I cannot live without paper towels. Cause that's what, you know, I use on all the, every time I clean. So I have to have those. I have probably like eight boxes of those warm cups now. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> you know, just way in advance. Cause you know, some things have just gone out of stock and then you're kind of screwed if you don't have them, you know? So, um, and I keep thinking right. about everything, like, what if I, you know, do I have enough cryo packs? Do I have enough heat packs? Do I have enough shipping boxes? You know, what if those go out of stock, you know, cause you kind of get in trouble real quick if you, something like that happens, but, um, all that stuff has gotten more expensive. Um, everything in general has gotten more expensive. So, I mean, it's just, you know, prices on geckos have gone up. Um, people seem to be willing to spend more on geckos. Um, so the market's been great. But, um, you know, costs have also gone up too, though. So. Yeah. Pros and cons with both, but obviously it's yeah. nice to get goes to go up <laughs> as a breeder. Yeah. Too. Yeah. It's, but. well, it's, I'm, I breed less than I have in the past and I don't sell as many pets off. And I think that helps people. There's a big couple of big breeders that got out of the game, um, in the last few years. And so I, I think that's 
picked up things for a lot of people. So, I mean, it's just, you know, new people have to come in and, you know, some people are getting out of it too. So it's just a cycle yeah. as well. But Right. Yeah. And especially I think established breeders are also staying in for a lot longer and they have been in the past, which is nice. So it probably takes also stress off of some of the bigger breeders and, including you in terms of, um, you know, quality of collections are out there, um, kind of gives more people some more other things to look at. Um, and then, you know, obviously you can't sustain the whole hobby. So. Um, yeah. I would never want to. I mean, I encourage a lot of people when I see somebody doing something ethically and honestly, I always encourage them to, you know, go forward with it. Cause you know, there's, a, there's I mean, it's kind of one of those things like there's, you know, we, Think of how many people in the world actually own a leopard gecko. This market's kind of endless for us, you know, and they're very, you know, once people, if they become more of a popular pet and this hobby grows, it just makes the interest grow more and more people share it online. Um, the more the interest grows, it's just better for everyone. So it's not like if some other breeder gets out there and is producing, you know, another thousand geckos out there, it really hurts me that much. It's really just yeah. created that much more interest in it. And there, you know, more breeders that are going to come out there and that they do it right is a good thing. And the less we have of the big mill breeders, you know, compared, um, you know, and more of the, the high quality, you know, smaller scale breeders, I think the better for the hobby at least. Yeah, exactly. And then also just producing new stuff. If we're, you know, in the same spot we are 10 years from now in the hobby, that's kind of <laughs> kind of scary if we're producing the same quality geckos that we are now so kind of leave space for just a little bit more you know innovation and other people have their own ideas with certain things that'll work well so that's always cool to see that yeah and if there was 100 breeders like me out there doing the same thing and you know um it would only benefit you know the the hobby and there'd be just that much more interest and that many more cool things coming out like you said there's just it, <clears throat> if i'm only if it's only what's coming out of my collection it would be boring for sure <laughs> Especially for you, just seeing your own stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. Yeah. yeah. But. Nice. Well, with everything that you're working with, is there anything that you're, just in terms of, you know, the gecko hobby right now, it um, doesn't have to necessarily be like parents or anything, but anything that you're really excited to get going 20, uh, 22, it's crazy. Um, but I don't know, just more time, <laughs> more time off, obviously. Um, sit back, kind of relax and see what the geckos produce next year. Yeah. I'm just looking forward to dialing in everything in the shop and getting it exactly the way I want it <laughs> organized perfectly. I'm still trying to organize some stuff. Um, once that's done, um, for as far as the geckos, um, some of the, like I said, some of the cipher stuff, mostly, um, I think most of it's, I guess there's another, I was going to start up, the sunrises and sunsets and some of those other so like that are not big like money makers or anything like that or like super demand but there's been a couple of people who have been wanting those um so figured i'd i i have a lot of the stuff kind of sitting on the back burner for years and i'm a lot of it i've either paired one pairing and i didn't get any eggs or whatever or just i haven't produced any so try to get up some of those uh smaller scale projects um that i've been sitting around for a while um, I think that would be one thing I want to do this next year now that I might have a little more time to myself. But, nice. Cool. Yeah. Well, we definitely have to get you on the podcast also more next year. Yeah. <laughs> had some people easier. messaging me <laughs> saying, what'd you do to John? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Got him on the that. podcast, but. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry for taking so long. I, you know, it's, I've, I've been wanting to get on here. It's just life has been crazy. You know, it was one thing after another and then none of, you know like taxes were due and then it was just like the shop one thing after another with that and um some things i had to do with the season like it was like i had to, i on my shop i i basically built it on a hillside and i, I brought in a lot of fill dirt and i had to get that all seeded out and planted so you know the erosion wasn't bad and had to you know take care of the, there's little things here and there the whole way. And it's just, it never kind of stopped. And then the delay in the racks, shipments from animal plastics and the delay in um, the, the heat tape, the, all these things were just adding on top of each other. And so, but 
finally filling some some air. <laughs> yeah. Well, we know in ten years from now when I need to <laughs> build a facility or whatever, then yeah. I'm coming to you. So <laughs> yeah, let me know. I'll tell you what to do. <laughs> Nice. Well, John, I appreciate you coming on the podcast and uh, we'll definitely get you back on again soon. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And yeah, just let me know whatever you want. I hope everyone enjoyed this episode with John. You guys already know the wealth of knowledge that John has when it comes to this stuff and the gecko hobby. He's been in it for such a long time now and his information and wealth of knowledge just shows so evidently every time that he speaks. As you guys know, at the end of each and every episode, we have our one big thing. And for this episode, I just wanted to highlight John's attention to detail. To me, it's so awesome to hear about the planning and effort that goes into John's operation, not only on the breeding side of things, but also with the new shop he's been building. And I think in this hobby, sometimes we see some of the top breeders who produce phenomenal animals, but really neglect to realize that these were the fruits of blood, sweat, and tears from decades back. There is... A ton of planning that goes into the smallest parts from feeder nutrition to heating an entire building and so much more, which I hope you guys noticed and can take back to your own operation and I know I will definitely be doing the same. And don't think that I forgot about the giveaway. Congrats to BD Geckos. Congratulations. Make sure to reach out to us to claim your prize. One last thing before we head out. I do have a pretty important message about the podcast and updates. With that, which will come out within the next couple of days on social media, so make sure to keep an eye on that in the next couple of days. I want to thank everyone for joining us on yet another episode of the Strength in Leo's podcast. Don't forget to share with a friend, rate our podcast, and subscribe. Follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Strength in Leo's. And last but not least, tune in next time for our next episode on Spotify, iTunes, Google Music, and our website, strengthinleos.com. This is your host, Evan Woldridge, signing off. Continue to grow in knowledge and share the strength and Leo.